director for the Center of Capacity Building here at the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Uh, here with me today is Andy Young from Org Code, uh, president and CEO. And we are going to spend the next hour talking about serving and supporting unsheltered homeless persons during COVID-19. A little uh, housekeeping and information um, for upcoming Alliance webinars. Uh, first, everyone is on mute uh, and will remain that way for the uh, duration of the broadcast. We have disabled the chat function in the webinar due to uh, security concerns around Zoom. However, the Q&A uh, box is available for you to submit your questions and answer or your questions there. Uh, no other attendee can see your questions um, and we will spend time with Ian um, during this afternoon to answer as, as many of those as we can. So a couple quick uh, notes. Uh, the National Alliance to End Homelessness uh, is continuing our COVID-19 webinar series. Um, and just want to make note that due to some scheduling conflicts with presenters and how rapidly information is changing um, and the urgent challenges communities are facing, we've had to move around some of the dates and times for our webinars. So um, if you visit the uh, links on the web, uh, the slide, uh, which will be available to you and posted um, uh, as early as tomorrow, you can register for um, those webinars, including working with FEMA to address homelessness during the pandemic and ensuring racial equity during the COVID-19 homelessness response. Um, uh, dates and times will be uh, available for those. Uh, also, we want to let you know to continue this conversation after the webinar is over. We encourage uh, people to um, connect uh, via Twitter um, in the hashtag um, COVID webinar, uh, where we are live tweeting this webinar and asking some questions and hope you will chime in there. Last, uh, the Alliance has just launched its Ending Homelessness Forum. This is a place for communities to obtain information on federal funding and guidance on the COVID-19 homeless response. Uh, communities can share information about the successes and emerging promising practices you're witnessing in your communities as you respond to this pandemic. And you can ask questions of each other um, with regard to some of the, uh, the challenges you're confronting. So to sign up for that uh, discussion forum, uh, you can see the link there. So without further ado, I want to hand it over to Ian. Ian, it is great to have you today and um, thanks so much for being with us. My pleasure and thanks for having me. So our topic today examines serving and supporting unsheltered persons during COVID-19. And I want to welcome you to participate in the discussion as you feel necessary uh, using the Q&A function if you have questions. And I encourage you to ask those throughout the webinar and we'll get to many of those uh, as we can uh, after I've finished the presentation. The format for today is as follows. I will speak for approximately 20 minutes, then we'll do approximately 20 minutes of FAQs that the Alliance has collected and then finally we'll spend 20 minutes answering as many questions as we can answer coming from all of you. Christy, I need control of the, there we go. Uh, at Orcode, we continue to figure out how to fine tune our offering and support during this time. Feel free to reach out to info at orcode.com with ideas or feed your ideas to the National Alliance to End Homelessness. You can stay on top of what Orcode is doing by staying connected to our Facebook page and Twitter feed. A lot of my attention the past couple of years has been spent transforming outreach to put a finer point on the need for professional service providers and a strong focus on housing with a coordinated entry interface. Uh, I should also say relevant for this webinar today, once upon a time, I ran a very large street outreach program. I'm also a strong advocate for ending homelessness and a longtime friend of the Alliance having presented at their conferences for over a decade. Just a few words before we get started with content. We are still learning when it comes to responses to unsheltered homelessness and COVID-19. It is entirely possible we'll learn more and even change course of direction as we acquire more knowledge. What I have prepared today is a synthesis of information available from reputable health sources, though to be clear, I'm providing absolutely zero direct health advice today. I will share promising and emerging practices from street outreach providers and relate it to my own experience as a practitioner. I would argue that street outreach is an essential service, in large part because of the potential impacts of the virus to unsheltered homeless persons. 
If you or your community have decided the street outreach is non-essential, you may have more problems when this is over. Nonetheless, if you do not do street outreach during this time, I would ask you where to redeploy street outreach staff, where their skills, training, and experience may still be needed, such as motel space or shelter. Perhaps it goes without saying that people who are homeless are likely to be terribly and disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. Researchers have made the case in this regard for all people who are homeless, and there's reason to believe matters may be worse for unsheltered persons. As imperfect as self-reported VI SPDAT data may be, we know from VI SPDAT records analyzed by the California Policy Lab, for example, that unsheltered homeless persons have approximately twice the acuity score as sheltered counterparts, and just under 50% of all undersheltered persons provide self-reported data indicating trimorbidity. It is in the best interest of every community to do early detection of all people, homeless or not, to see if they are exhibiting symptoms of COVID-19. You and I probably know the by heart now, disconnected from a 20, may not. It is also possible that some unsheltered homeless persons lack the cognitive capacity to know or think about symptom recognition and what to do if the symptoms are found. We need outreach to do non-clinical symptom screening and navigation for people who are unsheltered and have symptoms to get to appropriate resources. We also need to do outreach because this is a population that is likely going to get sick with grave consequences if we don't stay connected and have mechanisms for helping them access resources if needed. In many communities, we are seeing reduced hours or closure of drop-in centers, day centers, day shelters, and hygiene facilities and food programs. Typically, we could use these as another avenue for trying to connect with unsheltered persons and provide ongoing information and support, obviously, that is happening less or not at all right now. Consider this. If we are asking people to self-isolate, including those who are unsheltered, then the last thing we want are people moving all over town looking for food. On top of this, food security programs in many communities are operating differently during this time. In some communities where some unsheltered persons may rely upon discarded food, they may also find themselves finding less opportunities to source food. Outreach workers may find themselves responding to or bridging the need for access to food for unsheltered persons at this time. One of two strategies probably make the most sense based upon your community characteristics and the nature of how your unsheltered population group is organized when it comes to physical locations where people gather and sleep. The danger with using outreach staff in this regard is that food security could quickly become the sole function of the outreach team. I would suggest the communities may want to think of safely mobilizing volunteers to lead, assist, or support this function at this time. Outreach is also necessary to ensure there is access to important information on health and resources. Your run-of-the-mill community resource guide is not going to cut it right now. You and I both know that information is updated very frequently regarding COVID-19. Some of this information is entirely relevant to people who are unsheltered. What resources are open? What do I need to do to protect my health? Are there things I need to worry about if I use drugs while COVID-19 is spreading? What government benefits am I eligible for? These and other questions will dominate the thinking of many people who don't know how to access resources at this time. Sometimes the flow of information that needs to go out pertains to new initiatives specifically concerning unsheltered persons who are homeless. For example, in some communities, motels are being made available to unsheltered persons. In some instances, they are just for those people who are infected or symptomatic and need to be isolated. In other communities, this is for all unsheltered persons. So posters, one-pagers, and brochures should be created and disseminated on the following using plain language and as appropriate in your community multiple languages. These are as follows. What is COVID-19? What are the symptoms of COVID-19 infection? What are you supposed to do if you have the symptoms? What are you supposed to do if symptoms are worsening or you are in distress? What are the additional shelter opportunities or other types of accommodation at this time? What is physical distancing or sometimes known as social distancing? From an outreach perspective, what sort of materials are you preparing on the sorry we missed you but we want to speak with you? Have you prepared a resource list of what's available where and at what time? What guidance are you providing on harm reduction? And what guidelines you might be providing on encampment separation or distancing measures within encampments? For those of you 
uh, that are supporting people who use alcohol or other substances. We need to appreciate that access to substances has or is changing. Access to harm reduction education or supplies has or is changing. And access to detox or substance use recovery resources have or are changing. Let us not forget that housing is good harm reduction. Opportunities to secure financial resources that will help people meet daily subsistence needs, including access to alcohol or other drugs if they are addicted or dependent, are drying up. Furthermore, we are hearing in some places that unsheltered homeless individuals are having more difficulty finding easy access to product at this time, leading to withdrawal issues. Anecdotal, but there are some organizations that report that the people they are doing outreach to that were involved in sex work are finding it more difficult to have regular clientele at this time, and of course, practicing physical distancing in various forms of sex work is an impossibility. At the best of times, it can be a struggle to promote health and safety amongst unsheltered persons and to get others to take the health and safety of unsheltered persons seriously. One of the line nineteen is more and more communities have realized that homelessness needs to be attended to at scale to improve not only the health and safety of unsheltered persons, but the community as whole, which leads us to symptom screening. The source for these questions originally is Atlanta, but given how fast things are changing, it is entirely possible these have changed since I sourced them last week. I want to be super clear again, I'm not a health professional, I'm not providing health advice. But this idea of symptom screening is one area where, if at all possible, you want to get the most current guidance from your local public health professionals on which screening questions you should be asking and what exactly they want done from a health perspective if, these are, uh, if there are affirmatives to the questions. I would further recommend that you make a note that the questions were asked and record the time and date for when the questions were asked, but without recording the answers in any electronic record. It is the asking that we need to keep track of in the notes, not the responses. It seems odd mentioning this to outreach workers and their supervisors who rarely, if ever, want a sweep of a camp to happen. So this information is more for policymakers, law enforcement, and elected officials. The CDC has been quite clear that moving people along at this time presents great risks for the entire community. I know in some communities they have made the information from the CDC available to senior leadership within law enforcement to get them to change their practices. CDC guidance on this element suggests that if there are 10 or more occupants of an encampment, then providing hand washing stations and portable toilets is recommended. This is if there are not public restrooms available that are open and stocked with soap within a reasonable distance. There are many different definitions of what constitutes an encampment. I'm going to take a very loose definition and use it. One or more persons occupying a tent or other structure not meant for permanent human habitation in the same or reasonably close location for two or more consecutive nights. So what does this exclude? People who are sleeping rough without a structure of any kind as well as people with a structure who move far and wide on a daily basis. Physical separation between tents is easier said than done. Depending upon the configuration of the existing encampment, if there are multiple people in tents, how long the encampment has been in place, and the geographic area that the encampment is located within. Providing something akin to a floor plan or site plan that lays out how they can re reconfigure their camp can be very helpful for outreach workers to do with the occupants of the encampment. We need an up-to-date map of the service area of the street outreach team that marks where every single person known to be outside is located and who is in each of the encampments. This can be old school paper, but you may find the updating and continuous surveillance is easier through the likes of Google Maps. Of course, you can get fancy with apps and GIS as well if need be. The information you mapped out can be critical to planning, prioritizing, and responding for both outreach and health purposes. If you've not mapped all the encampments that are known in your community, this is a strongly recommended next step in the coming days. Many street outreach workers are part of the frontline defense against overdoses, especially opioid related overdoses. 
Health authorities have speculated that those who use fentanyl and opioids are at greater risk of complications if they contract COVID-19 because of the slower, shallow breathing that occurs amongst users of these substances. If people are open to switching substances, even for a while, it's worth the conversation. So say the harm reduction experts. Where multiple people use alcohol or other drugs together, outreach workers may have to reinforce how to continue to use and maintain physical distancing. Uh, the one document I have found from a reputable health agency re recommends the use of PPE if administering naloxone at this time. While outreach workers are busy educating unsheltered persons with regards to COVID-19 available resources, it is also necessary to be promoting appropriate safe shelter options and not losing sight of the importance of permanent housing, which if realized will improve physical distancing. Every community should create a workflow that outlines the actions to be taken based upon each decision point for addressing possible or confirmed infections amongst those who are homeless and specifically amongst those who are unsheltered. You may wish to create a specific workflow just for those who are unsheltered because the needs of outreach workers in the decision process may be all or different from those of their shelter counterparts. This is how we build consistency across street outreach providers where there's more than one outreach provider in your community and build consistency with other parts of the system so that they are aware of what we are doing, when and for whom, based upon a logical sequence. The workflow should capture everything from screening to assisting with self-isolation. And I know that the text on this workflow is small. I wanted to show you a comprehensive example. This one comes from Alberta, Canada. I won't go through it in great detail now, but it is the sort of thing that if you want to contact me after the webinar, I can send your way so you can build one off of it. If you've not created a workflow for the entire home system and the interface with health services in the context of COVID-19, create one, think through each step and decision point that needs to be made along the way. Even if there wasn't a pandemic, the street outreach workers often struggle with which unsheltered persons to engage, in which order and where to prioritize their time. Simply put, mine your data to inform your street outreach strategy at this time. You wanna make contact with people known to be of a certain age, particularly those 55 years or older is the general guidance. People with certain pre-existing conditions and especially people that are of an older age and have those pre-existing conditions. I would start with people who mean both, then those who are oldest, then those with pre-existing conditions, but again, consult your local health authorities if necessary for guidance on the order they would recommend you outreach to in your community. Unless your jurisdiction has special authorities, homeless individuals and families must voluntarily choose to use services, including newly added special facilities to assist people who are homeless during the pandemic. Don't be surprised if there's a backlash in your community if you increase shelter capacity, but non-sick and non-symptomatic people continue to choose to stay outdoors. Outreach workers will need to use their power of persuasion. There are also reports from several communities that some people that have been staying in shelter have abandoned shelter to go outdoors because they feel it is a safer option right now. The truth is based upon the shelter condition and physical distancing within the shelter, they may be right. If there are people relocating outdoors, it is important that outreach examine known information in HMIS prior to replicating work that might have already been conducted. Well, this can make it appear that there are a lot of options. Each comes with pros and cons, and some, especially the last two, may have more cons than pros to even discuss at the moment. First option, stay in place. In this instance, outreach workers educate, support the person to remain as safe as possible, and not move or have a, the least amount of movement possible. Option two is to move to a new encampment spot. This may make sense if the current encampment location is heavily crowded or doesn't allow for a 12 by 12 spot for each tent or structure. This may also make sense if your community is open to sanctioned and properly resourced sanctioned encampment. Option three and four are motel options. Some communities have expanded capacity through motels for anyone who's in sheltered. Other communities have expanded it only for those who are in need of self-isolation. A few communities I know of have expanded motel space for people who are of a certain age, have pre-existing conditions and were unsheltered. Option five is only possible if shelters in the community have vacant space and would be appropriate. Option six is like the motel option, just a building that is repurposed to be a shelter for the time being, like a convention center. 
Option seven may be used by the unsheltered person from time to time anyway. This option would only make sense if the place is safe. The friend or family member felt that they could provide an extended stay and not put their own tenancy in danger. The unsheltered person can stay for approximately a month or more and the occupants can self-isolate again if the unsheltered person joins the housed person. And option eight has almost identical considerations to option seven with additional concerns about the availability and safety to travel to the family member they are reuniting with. Coordinated entry should not come to a grinding halt right now. There are opportunities that can be seized. Some of the people who access services now who are unsheltered may be more inclined to think about housing if before they were hesitant to refusing. Some landlords are very captive audience sources right now as well. And I know, for example, in Phoenix, uh, by last week, Home Inc. had housed over 60 people since March 16th. Diversion efforts may make sense to expand at this time, especially focused on people at the precipice of homelessness for the first time or newly in shelter. And if your community uh, in your prioritization process have used the principle of aligning people with the greatest needs to the next available resources with appropriate supports, it may be time to reevaluate who is currently in greatest needs. Of course, we want outreach workers to remain healthy physically, emotionally, and spiritually. At a minimum, hand washing properly for at least 20 seconds or hand sanitizing with a hand sanitizer with at least 60% alcohol should occur before and after every single outreach encounter. New guidelines, as I suspect you are all aware, recommend wearing a mask when out in community. All outreach counters should be happening from at least six feet away and this should be clearly communicated why to the person that is being outreached to. Even if you have appropriate protective gear and sanitizing equipment, transport should be done cautiously and sparingly if at all. Safety of outreach workers is also important if they have good communication materials as we discussed before that they can leave with the person being outreached to. Even without a pandemic, not advised to make it a habit to touch or carry people's stuff. If it is absolutely necessary though, masks and gloves are recommended with hand washing or hand sanitizing before and after. Full PPE is likely only gonna be needed if administering the likes of naloxone. For items of service that require consent, it may be preferable to examine verbal consent at this time in accordance with the requirements for consent and privacy in your jurisdiction. And finally, safety is improved if we help people move into housing where they can physically distance and self-isolate. Your local workflow regarding what to do if someone is encountered with symptoms or illness is critical. Outreach workers should not be trying to problem solve on the spot in, the, in these matters. In some instances, it may make sense to walk with people to a health professional or special shelter space for people who are symptomatic. In other instances, 911 may be appropriate, especially if the person is in distress. It should also be anticipated that some people with mild symptoms refuse to go anywhere, at which point street outreach has to inform the person of what to do if their condition changes and likely increase their engagement. Depending upon your jurisdiction, this may also trigger other professionals getting involved. Taking the time to debrief the encounters, whether they access resources or not, is helpful to improve the workflow and future engagement strategies. And it's also possible, though very rare, that outreach will encounter someone who has died as a result of COVID-19. Part of the learning and healing process has got to involve remembering the dead. While some partnerships, such as with health officials, are almost universally needed, other partnerships will be dictated by your local reality during the pandemic and where you're at in terms of rates of infection and urgency people feel to respond to the health of those who are homeless. This one is a no-brainer on many levels. It's my impression thus far from talking with communities that those of the single point of contact within each of these domains of health services seems to be faring better than those who are trying to navigate the entire system as John or Jane Q public. Navigating the health systems isn't just about COVID-19. Considerations need to be had regarding unsheltered homeless persons who have pre-existing conditions, physical or mental, where they have been tapped into health services but now find that connection is uh, interrupted. And we also need to expand harm reduction supports and supplies at this time. Some people are gonna find it difficult to access safer supplies. Some people are finding it more difficult to get products from uh, sources that they know, which puts them at risk for the uh, content and potency of what they're sourcing from others. And they may not have access to the same safety net in the event of overdose. 
I would strongly recommend a document by the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, which outlines pharmacotherapy approaches to assisting people with addictions and dependencies at this time. An outreach worker cannot adequately promote shelter options if they don't know firsthand what shelter options and the state of those shelter options are. So there's a bit of work to be done by outreach providers to know this firsthand. Outreach workers should know and relay information on how things have changed within the shelter system, even to those people who are unsheltered who previously rejected shelter. And this includes additional surge spaces or additional uh, facilities that have been brought online. Many communities around the world impacted by the pandemic have reported increases in domestic violence while people shelter in place. I'd be remiss if I didn't point out the importance of street outreach workers having good working knowledge of how to access DV resources in your community currently in case an unsheltered person or family is in need of them. Police and other law enforcement can be incredible assets at this time given they are also essential workers and have street involvement. If you have a homeless outreach team, a HOT, a joint planning call, or Zoom is recommended to make sure you're all on the same page and not duplicating efforts. Consolidating information on known encampments can also be critical. To reiterate, no sweeps should be happening at this time. However, not all law enforcement may be privy to that information, so education is important. To close my section before we get into the FAQs and your questions, I just wanna say the street outreach if done well can be a lifesaver at this time. We should see that street outreach is not a fringe part of the homeless service delivery system, but rather a critical function, especially now. Ian, thank you so much for, for, for that time and, and just laying out some really critical um, topics and, and challenging areas and, and opportunities that you know have um, emerge for people to come together and work more closely, serve people who are unsheltered. So um, thank you for that. And for folks listening, we will uh, touch base with Ian and uh, get from him some of the resources that he uh, spoke of and, and make sure that we make them available to you on our uh, community forum. So Ian, um, I wanted to just circle back on a few of the um, of the things that you brought up and, and ask you to maybe go, in, uh, go into a little bit more in depth on, on some of those um, topics. Um, I, we are getting questions in, so I do want to provide some time to, to cover those. So I have, I have a couple of, um, of questions that I wanted to see if you could explore a little bit more. So um, can you talk to us uh, a little bit more about um, how uh, your, your thoughts on um, pri how to prioritize available indoor space um, when there are not enough options to get everybody inside? Yeah, so this is definitely going to be a, a situation that's coming up in some communities more so than others <clears throat> and likely happening in communities that already had uh, some tremendous pressures on their shelter system and their uh, nature of their unsheltered population um, being so large prior to COVID-19. Uh, so a few things that I think are going to be necessary. One is to confirm uh, with your local community partners, who is the target that you want to have come inside? Um, so I talked about people of a certain age and people with pre-existing health conditions. You probably want to confirm those at a local level and then mine your data to actually create a list of everybody who's in, enrolled in outreach who meets those criteria. And that would be the very first start for me. I would start to prioritize to whom I want to go provide street outreach services based upon uh, those who meet those criteria and especially people who meet both of those criteria. And so that's the first thing. Uh, the next thing I'd say is uh, we probably also need to be using some of our uh, softer skills on this. Um, conversations with each other around who are particularly vulnerable, who don't meet those criteria, but you're worried about their wellness. This may include people who have uh, known brain injuries, cognitive capacity issues, developmental delays, certain types of mental illness, where you may be concerned that they're not processing the information that's being given to them about self-isolating and safety on the street and therefore want to strongly encourage an indoor option. And uh, I guess the last consideration that I would, uh, that I would say communities might want to consider is uh, those people that you have a history of working with uh, where you know where they're at in the housing process. So, for example, if I had someone that I knew could move into housing next week, 
uh, I may or may not use a shelter bed for them compared to someone where uh, we are months away from a potential uh, housing option for them, in which case um, you can kind of work on, on the destination uh, piece a little bit more thoroughly from examining when they're going to move into housing. I mean, that, that, that's really helpful. We've, we've, um, we've received a, a couple of questions, not just in this webinar, but just, just about that in prioritization in, in particular. Um, so uh, my follow-up question to that is, so you talked a little bit about how outreach staff can ensure their own safety and taking precautions. So I'm wondering if you could maybe talk more specifically about how, e how outreach staff um, assist persons experiencing unsheltered homelessness to mo move to or connect to those available indoor spaces, assuming that they have them, while at the same time following safety protocols. Yeah, so I reached out to uh, about a dozen street outreach providers that I know to, to ask them this question, because it does really um, complicate what we would normally do in a street outreach situation. So uh, depending upon geography and location of resources, again, that's always going to be a consideration. Uh, but uh, the four solutions that seem to be the most prevalent were uh, walking with people while maintaining separation distance or, or physical distancing from each other. Uh, so it was accompaniment but that separation has walked. Uh, seemed to be popular in urban environments where a lot of homeless services were located in like a downtown core or one particular area of the city. Second one that uh, came up in some larger urban areas was use of masks in public transit. Uh, so being able to provide the mask to the individual, the mask for the street outreach provider, maintaining as best physical space they can, and then actually taking buses or subways. Um, third was the use of medical transportation companies. So I encountered uh, one community that said this has been a lifesaver, uh, that they've been able to come up with a contract with a, a company that normally does medical transportation, uh, and they're using that contract to transport people from unsheltered locations to other locations, even if they're not symptomatic. And then the last one was modified street outreach vans, uh, usually um, with drivers in full uh, personal protective equipment. Uh, and uh, for example, <clears throat> I believe it's Dallas, but it's definitely Texas. Uh, got a picture the other day of an outreach worker uh, walking through uh, the different measures that they've taken to ensure their safety at this time. But it certainly isn't a business as usual. And of course, we need to have considerations for how many people we would uh, put in a van at any one point in time at this given uh, juncture. Mm. Ian, do you mind um, just repeating the, the very first one, accompaniment? You broke up just a little bit, and I think it was probably a, a, something that people don't want to miss. Yeah, walking with people while maintaining physical separation. So it really comes down to if you are located within walking distance of the resource, then walk with the person. Okay. Even if it takes you long time. Okay. Um, and I'm just kind of hitting some of the, 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 the highlight areas. So um, can you talk to us about um, in, in the, the communities that you've been speaking to, um, what some examples of indoor space that other communities should be exploring uh, within their own communities about where to move um, people experiencing unsheltered homelessness? Yep, so uh, hotels and motels are the most popular, uh, I mean, unscientific study. Uh, convention centers uh, are tend to be um, increasing in popularity, not just as makeshift hospitals, but as makeshift areas for people who are unsheltered homeless to go. Uh, some communities have used decommissioned hospitals or long-term care facilities, nursing home type places. Um, a few communities that I've come across have uh, been able to take over large warehouses, large warehouse spaces. Mm -hmm. um, the key part there was ensuring that there was appropriate ventilation and appropriate restroom facilities either within the warehouse or being like porta potties and portable hand washing stations being brought to the warehouse. Uh, community and recreation centers, uh, churches, synagogues and temples and other places of worship. Uh, basketball or hockey arenas, and uh, I know of one community that is currently exploring adding a sprung structure at this time. Mm -hmm. um, so the other, the other, the last question before we move into the um, the Q and A, because I, I can see a lot of really excellent questions coming in. Um, so 
uh, I know you touched upon the community partnerships, and I think we're certainly finding um, those communities where existing relationships with um, mental health, the mental health system, behavioral health system, the, the, the public health system, um, those are relationships that looks like in a lot of communities are paying off. Um, but, you know, some communities di didn't, don't have or don't have the, um, maybe the, the history of those, those connections with those the other systems. And so I'm wondering um, from what you've heard and what you know, how outreach staff tangibly can partner with their local um, uh, and specifically healthcare provider system. So it's, it's finding the entry point. Uh, and so I, what I've found with some communities is they try to engage with the health system on their own and they uh, find themselves met with a closed door, uh, lack of receptiveness in some communities. But when those same communities uh, ask someone in the mayor's office or ask someone senior up within, let's say law enforcement was another example provided to me, they were able to make some of the contacts and start the conversation with healthcare providers at a senior level. So not, not that frontline, how we're going to make this work. And that's very different than how a lot of people uh, work in the outreach space where we're kind of fly by the seat of our pants, figure this out with the frontline staff we know in other organizations. This is definitely a senior management to senior management discussion because what we need them to do is to figure out and agree what is the information flows? How is health going to provide information from us? How are we going to provide information to health? Two, what is that workflow? So in all different situations that we might encounter in street outreach that has a health interface, can we get them to co-create that workflow with us together or even ask them to create a workflow for us? And a lot of healthcare providers have already done this decision-making matrix for other community partners like law enforcement. So uh, we're not asking them to duplicate work. We're asking them to share their work uh, and then assuring that we have a contact person. Now, if your community has uh, started an emergency command center of some sort or emergency management center of some sort, uh, this can flow through the emergency command center in terms of the contact person with health uh, to get things started or spearheaded from uh, a kind of a, again, that senior management function. And then uh, leveraging that which we already had. So um, let's say I knew Joe. Joe was a mobile behavior health specialist. Uh, well, now I need my boss to talk to Joe's boss. And then maybe my boss's boss needs to talk to Joe's boss's boss until we actually have a very formalized kind of agreement of how to make things work. Um, really, I think the, the key here is being able to sell uh, why is it in the best interest of health to become involved in this issue? And even if they normally don't care at all about homelessness, I'll bet you they care a lot about disease transmission right now and the spread of the virus. If they can help us decrease spread by improving access to resources uh, and information for people who are homeless, that is really in their best interest. So I would really be catering to what they think is in their best interest. Great. Thank you for that, Ian. Um, so we've, we've got a handful of questions that have come in, um, and so I'm going to kind of take them from uh, when I received them. So I, I want to uh, ask you to talk a little bit about the strategies related to um, stopping the, the sweeping of homeless encampments. So we have someone who said that their community is having a, a difficult time stopping the city's policy of sweeping homeless encampments. Um, they know that this is critical, uh, the critical importance to not do this. And so wondering if you could maybe talk through um, some, some strategies that they might employ to um, uh, use their powers, I guess, of persuasion, as you referenced earlier, to get the city to stop doing this. Well, listen, I think that any city that continues on that process, um, here's the angle I would take. Let me back up a little bit. The angle I would take is this. Uh, the more that you sweep people who are homeless, the longer the social uh, distancing and self-isolation for the rest of us has to occur. So uh, it's really in the community's best interest from a health perspective that, uh, as I understand it from the CDC, that we don't want there to be any sweeps at this point in time. So uh, I you know, definitely am not a fan of sweeps uh, at the best of times. Uh, especially ones without any sort of coordination or resources 
but I can even park all that for right now and say, let's go at this and see if we can peel the people's senses just from the impact this will have on health, not just of people who are homeless, but the impact this could have on the health of the entire community at this time. Mm -hmm. So this isn't about like just stopping doing something for people or stop doing something to people who are homeless. This is about protecting all of our health uh, if we go about doing this right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, thank you on that. I think I think so. Definitely, communities are uh, more than one community is facing that. I wanted to go back and ask a clarifying question around the around the the, the screening um, uh, questions that you that you spoke of earlier. So there was a question. Um, you said that um, that it's important that you do the asking um, record uh, that, that that asking took place and not the answer. Um, so could you elaborate a little bit more about why, why that is? Why wouldn't we want to record the answer? I want communities to demonstrate that they're actually doing the symptom screening, but I think we need to be very cautious in terms of recording health information. Mm -hmm. um, and that's really what it comes down to. So if, if a specific outreach worker at a kind of very localized computer or tablet or uh, paper wanted to record answers, I don't think that's a problem. Where I think this becomes potentially more problematic is if you have an open HMIS system and now anybody and everybody can go in and look at people's health information. And yes, there's measures and uh, put in place in terms of read only access and rights access within HMIS. I just think this is one of the examples where even with uh, increased data sharing in HMIS for all sorts of purposes, coordinate entry and otherwise, uh, it can work against us if we start putting all sorts of really personal health information in a place where anybody can see it. So it might be shared with health professionals, uh, but I wouldn't be sharing it far and wide within the homeless service delivery system unless your jurisdiction allows for that sort of uh, private health information to be shared liberally at this time. Mm -hmm. And I just was thinking, I, I, um, I believe HUD actually put out some guidance on disclosure of, um, of uh, some of the health information. So we'll try to find that and put that in the resources as well. So thank you for that. We got a couple questions regarding that. Um, so I want to, uh, you, you did raise this, but I want to offer you an opportunity to, to maybe go in a little bit deeper. So, so some um, folks have asked, should we just bypass our coordinated entry process for housing and just put people in open units, just basically bypass coordinated entry? Thoughts on that? So I would say no, um, it, because I actually think that this is not a time that we can accelerate coordinated entry and fix a bunch of the, the roadblocks or, or speed bumps in coordinated entry. Um, I would say that if we want throughput within our system, uh, we're going to be in a position where we can take people who are existing within our coordinated entry process, move them into housing, and then free up those spaces for other people who are homeless at the same time. And I think that this, it would be misguided to uh, have people jumping the queue, uh, as it were, uh, to move directly into housing just because they were unsheltered, um, generally speaking. Uh, now, that would be an ideal situation. I think if you uh, do have a bottleneck in your community relative to coordinated entry or, and or if you do have an opening of a bunch more housing resources than you didn't have, you might want to re-examine the prioritization process of your coordinated entry and who would go to the top of the list in prioritization, uh, but I wouldn't upend your entire coordinated entry system at this time. Connect. I missed the question. Sorry, Ian. I actually, for a moment there, I thought that we had lost you, but in reality, it was my connection that was unstable. So I apologize. Um, uh, I, I didn't hear the the uh, end part of your uh, end part of your uh, question. Uh, Keep so doing coordinated entry. That's okay, it. great, <laughs> super, thanks. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, you talked about outreach staff's power of per persuasion. So um, we're, we've gotten some questions about, um, you know, what to do if uh, folks um, who are unsheltered, who may be um, symptomatic or 
uh, of the prior guidance group don't want to go into sh go into shelter or a temporary crisis unit, or even for folks who who come into shelter uh, and a, a jurisdiction has a stay at home. Um, order uh, and they want to come to and fro. Uh, we, we're getting lots of questions about um, how uh, both actually outreach staff and um, and shelter staff can uh, persuade folks to take precautions that will keep them and others safe. Can you talk a little bit about some of those powers of persuasion? Well, I think most powers of persuasion start trying to appeal to that which is of greatest importance to people. And, and if that is in fact their life, then that's a good place to start, right? That, that if they wanna be in a position where they uh, are going to be safer than <clears throat> accessing resources for their health, especially if they're symptomatic or in their best interest. Um, I did, however, uh, in my preparation for this webinar, have the opportunity to talk to um, uh, some police in different jurisdictions. And uh, one of them uh, was saying that uh, when persuasion is not working uh, and you have someone who's in a place where they are believed to be symptomatic or unwell, um, that there usually is uh, an opportunity. Now, this would be in extreme, extreme cases. I'm, I'm certainly not saying we start using this liberally and everywhere, but if you were really concerned about someone's health and they were refusing services and they didn't have mild symptoms and they were deteriorating, then using involuntary commitment uh, might make sense when the powers of persuasion are not getting through to the individual uh, in these circumstances uh, because that involuntary commitment uh, um, can use uh, refusal to seek medical care uh, related to a suspected coronavirus infection as uh, uh, or the interpretation of that as self neglect um, so i wouldn 't um, i wouldn 't say that we use that far and wide. I think that it really comes down to conversation um, but I do think that uh, when we our powers of persuasion are not working are good. Uh, engagement skills are not working, our good reframing skills are not working, our good uh, skills of, of uh, patience and trying from different angles aren't working, that if you're really worried about someone's health and well-being, then we need to look at what legal measures there are to help them access health services. Great, thank you for that. Um, a next question I have is around, um, around actually a new sanctioned encampments that are established uh, specifically for the COVID response. Um, so this one is about staffing, and I don't know if you have uh, kind of specific uh, advice or guidance, but uh, folks are interested in hearing like what you think the minimal or ideal, ideal levels of staffing would be for say an encampment with about 50 tents. So, um... Yeah, I think if you had two staff 24 seven, you'd probably be fine. Okay, great. All right, that was quick, excellent. Um, so the uh, next question is around, is actually a, a rural uh, specific question. Um, specific recommendations for rural outreach um, and or setting up tents or other outdoor spaces to function as service centers where services don't usually exist. So do you, do you have any recommendations around how rural outreach or the setting up of outdoor spaces um, might look like in a rural, uh, in a rural setting? Um, uh, for example, to provide meals, uh, resource referrals, information about COVID-19, um, or anything like that. Any, any insights on rural outreach and how that might be different from urban outreach? Yeah, I think that here it comes down to, um, you know, some of the same strategies that are often used in rural environments around point and time counts. Uh, and I don't use gathering spot as in let's put a high densely volume of crowded people together that would violate physical distancing stuff that we're trying to do right now. But creating more kind of centralized places where people in rural environments can come uh, to access food or to, if you are going to create a motel opportunity or hotel opportunity, a church opportunity, a sanctioned campment opportunity, whatever it is that you wanted to do in that rural environment. Um, I would think strategically across the rural area, what are like the, the few places that might make sense to create these kind of, um, 
central meeting places, but again, not in crowds, um, and advise people uh, of their uh, existence and how and when to access them. Mm -hmm. Great. Now, the, my next question is going to maybe kind of um, start uh, down the path of the webinar that you're going to join us on on Thursday, which everyone, if you haven't seen, Ian is going to uh, spend about 30 minutes with us talking about supporting remote work. Um, uh, and so uh, be on the lookout uh, to register for that. But Ian, I, because your expertise and experience goes obviously way beyond um, your, your experience in, in providing street outreach, but also with regard to you know the entire homeless response system, one we're getting some questions around this, and we have received the alliance has received questions about this uh, since pretty much since the not long after the pandemic erupted, which is m many communities um, because they are so focused um, on the crisis aspect of the of the pandemic, their, their systems and processes for moving people through to permanent housing have kind of come to a halt. Uh, and so I'm wondering um, if you have any thoughts on communities that have uh, basically stopped or have seriously uh, had to slow down or are slowing down their efforts to get people permanently housed and how permanent housing is a part of this response and making sure that people are safe. Um, so just wondering if you have seen other communities struggling with this and what they're doing to ensure that they can continue moving people into permanent housing. So yes, this will be a, a chunk of the uh, webinar that we do the, later uh, in the week. Um, I think it was probably entirely appropriate in any, if not most places, that they did slow down or stop uh, when this first was emerging. Uh, we didn't know the risks um, necessarily as well as we know now. We didn't know the precautions to we take as well as we know now. And in, in many communities, it was all hands on deck just to get whatever resources you could for people who had been sheltered or were unsheltered uh, at a scale. So that was kind of the first wave. And I think that's entirely appropriate. But I also think that we're entering into this next space where uh, we know stuff. I mean, I imagine there's, you know, some of the slides and commentary I provided today was like, oh my God, someone's telling me to wash my hands again. Why am I on a webinar with someone tell me to wash my hands? Uh, <laughs> there's a, like, there's some stuff we just know now that we don't have to be thinking through. And this is where I think we can get back to how can we walk and chew gum? Uh, how can we exist and have a crisis response in the face of a pandemic while starting to open the spigot again around getting people into housing and have that flow uh, happening through uh, the throughput side of this. Uh, we also know uh, from discussions with some communities that they have found landlords to be a more captive audience than they ever had before and large property managers. Um, this doesn't mean that landlords and property managers aren't busy, but uh, dealing with existing tenancy issues and, and those sorts of things. But the, the ability to say, like, we can actually talk about strategy now in a way that uh, we didn't have time before, especially if the person who's developing that strategy is not a direct service worker and can work at that policy level or the system, the civil system level uh, to build some of that connectivity. So um, if you did slow it down or stop it, I think that we are entering to the phase where we can re-enter into making that happen. Uh, I also think that we can do that in ways that are gonna have uh, huge impacts for your crisis response system right now, if not now, uh, a few months hence. It is uh, theorized by some that this will result in an increase in homelessness. If we don't get to a place where we wrap our arms around trying to get people out of homelessness now, as well as in the future, uh, I think that the entire system might be overwhelmed by the volume of need at one point in time if we just hold off on housing people until uh, this passes us by. Right, right. Thank you. Um, I have a couple more questions um, actually related to, to food. Uh, the tiers uh, to do some of that food distribution and I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more to um, communities that are that are using volunteers. Where are they getting these folks? How are they um, preparing them to 
uh, ensure, I don't know, training or just precautions to make sure that they're taking uh, their precautions for themselves and for the people that they're distributing food to, to ensure their safety. So just interested in the volunteer and any other ideas that you have seen or heard about where folks are uh, able to leverage um, maybe non-homeless system resources for food distribution, food, um, food um, pr preparation and distribution. Yeah, so a lot of uh, what I've been intrigued by on this particular one has been um, the use of existing meal programs in a different way. So let's say you had a drop-in center that was accustomed to making breakfast or lunch for people every single day. Well, those people tend to already have a volunteer base and tend to already have food handler certificates or whatever the equivalent is in your jurisdiction. So we're actually taking that existing resource and we're making it work differently now uh, and getting some of those uh, existing volunteers to a place where they're trained on safety and so they understand why this is in, you know, uh, important and how they can maintain their safety during this time. So that's one. The other one that I've seen has been uh, an extension of use of volunteers at some food banks, uh, knowing that a lot of communities have expanded food security options and uh, just using the homelessness service delivery system as an extension of that. Uh, I wanna be clear, a lot of this food distribution I'm talking about, it's not warm meals to go. It is uh, sandwiches, low maintenance food preparation, and it is going to the encampments, maintaining a physical separation distance of six feet and essentially saying, I brought you food, here it is, and then uh, vacating the area. Um, that seems to be where a lot of it is, uh, is, is focused on, is that idea of kind of getting close. Um, where the drop-in center, whatever, has been in place, I mean, I, I've only heard um, that have done the equivalent of takeout, where they um, are preparing meals, they're putting them in takeout containers or brand lunch bags, and then people line up six feet apart from each other and one by one get access to their food. So um, I think leveraging existing food assets as opposed to trying to recreate part of your system is in everybody's best interest. Great, thank you. That, this has been so helpful, and we're, we're coming up to the, to the end of our webinar, so I, I want to just provide you an opportunity to let folks know about um, the, the deeper dive um, information about this, and I also want to let folks know that the questions that we were not able to get to um, during the uh, webinar today, uh, we will certainly go through those and uh, uh, identify some common themes, and we will post uh, those questions to the community uh, forum for folks to um, uh, be able to share uh, maybe uh, answers that they might have or uh, examples. So please uh, sign up for the community forum where you can exchange information with, uh, with each other. Um, and again, just to let everybody know, the re this recording um, and the, the PowerPoint presentation, uh, and we will have a, a one-page takeaway as well as we'll follow up with Ian to get some of the resources that he um, spoke about. And it will be posted on our website. If you register for this webinar, you will and attended. Uh, what registered is enough. We will send you um, a link to let you know that they are available. So Ian, I just wanted to give you an opportunity. I know you have a you have a resource that goes um, much more uh, in depth on this issue. And I don't know if you wanted to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, I, again, you know, take a quick snapshot if you uh, want a deeper dive, take a quick snapshot of your screen. Um, last week I did a one and a half hour webinar on unsheltered homelessness and street outreach. Obviously with the time constraints today, I've only hit the highlights. Uh, if you want a deeper dive, I encourage you to watch this video. It was done with the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness, but there are a number of uh, Americans on the call and uh, a number of U.S. specific questions that we addressed. Great, and we'll be sure to post it as well, Ian, so that people can can see it there if they don't catch it here. Um, and then uh, you kindly uh, provided your um, contact information. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, so rather than the usual info at orco.com, that's my direct email address. Wow. I do try to, to um, read emails, you know, at least once a month. <laughs> um, and so uh, you can email me as necessary. Uh, Twitter at Orcode, website Orcode.com, Facebook is a good place to like Orcode to stay on top of what we're doing. And that is my direct phone number. Um, so uh, don't call me because I don't answer the phone, but text me. And if you have a burning question that we didn't get through today that you want to text me um, because it's really pressing and you want some feedback in your community, uh, I invite you to do so. 
Ian, thank you so much for being so accessible to, to the Alliance and being such a great partner with us and uh, for everyone on this, um, on this call. So we thank you so much for joining you. Uh, we'll see you again, Ian, on uh, Thursday at 3 uh, at the same place. And everybody, please be safe and, and be well. We'll talk to you soon. Bye now.